Hey, so thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate it. I'm glad you reached out to me because I enjoy your podcast. I was watching a couple of them and I think they're insightful. You have some uh, a purpose behind it. Like you want to help guys expand in their leadership abilities and that kind of thing. So I thought that was really cool. It's called Tuco's Talks and it's on, yes. is it just on YouTube or can you get it anywhere else? No, you can you can jump on Rumble. Uh, we're also on the audio. So you can go Spotify, Apple Music and, okay. and all those too. Great. Well, again, thanks again for coming on. I, I was looking through over your bio and I, it's just such a fascinating career. I mean, it didn't, I wasn't expecting, I knew some parts of your career, kind of like everybody gets on here. I only know part of the story. Right. The, uh, the first part was fascinating and then the ending is fascinating, but I know we can't talk much about it, but I, it was just such a different career and I'm, I'm curious to hear about it. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to you. Let's, you know, talk to me about how you got in the military and then just go from there chronologically. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, first off, just thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come on here and, and to talk. It's it's so amazing to be able to share your own story, uh, but hopefully someone will learn something and uh, and be able to to take away some knowledge base. So thanks. Sure. So my career was crazy strange. Uh, and, you know, you can just sort of see how I, I've been walked through uh, and blessed throughout my career. So when when I started, it started in college. So I was playing college football, uh, at Sanford university and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So my dad took me by the shoulder and was like, Hey, go walk into, uh, the ROTC and tell him that you want to do this. So my dad was a backseater in an F4. Oh, okay. Uh, so he had that, that history. And so I walk in and there was this Lieutenant Colonel, um, B 52 guy. And, uh, I walk in and literally the first thing I said was, I'm willing to give this a shot, but I'm not cutting my hair. <laughs> and uh, so I had my my hair down to here. I had a little ponytail. Um, and so there was this movie called The Program. It was yeah. back in the day. It was a football movie. And Latimer, uh, I, want, I wanted to have my hair like Latimer. <laughs> and so my son, he had super long hair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it was, it was down to here. And so I was all for it and, you know, sure. it, it's just a fun time and, and sure. life just to, to try something new. But so I walk in anyway, uh, fast forward a million years and I, and I liked it and I enjoyed it. And so I went in and he sold me on, you can go and fly. I will get you a waiver for your eyes and you can go do that. And I was like, I'm in, so let's go. So, uh, obviously the wa waiver didn't come through. Um, and I started off finance but I got the PRK surgery. So I was one of the first PRK surgeries in the air force was doing a study on me and, and my eyes. And so they granted five people to go to pilot training and the rest were not. And so I was not one of the five that, uh, was granted a pilot slot. So I went to nav training, which is great. I just wanted to go fly. So I went and flew, uh, from there, uh, I went to nav training down San Antonio, uh, and I did get the B-52, uh, which that was not my first choice. Yeah. Uh, so I I literally was like, I want the HC-130. I want to be a part of helping people. I'd rather do rescue than drop bombs. And so that's, that's sort of my personality, and that's who I am. And of course, I get the opposite. Uh, HC-130 <laughs> didn't drop, so I went the other way. Uh, <laughs> And, and the B-52 was amazing because they, they took me and really developed me as a weapons expert. And so I went to the pre-weapons school, school. I, I went to anything and everything that I could just sit and learn. Uh, and then the way, the way I got to be an ALO was my wife loves Colorado, loves it. And she's like, I want to go. And I'm almost like, well, we're in the B-52. There's no way I can go. <laughs> right. So then I hear this story about this thing called an ALO. And you don't ever go ALO. <laughs> right. That's like a career killer. Nobody <laughs> goes. It's the worst of the worst. You know, yeah. anything and everything that the rated community could tell me how bad it was, yeah. that was it. <laughs> um, so I was like, I want to go do this because it's Fort Carson and I want to try it. And uh, I go to my wife and I was like, listen, just so you know, like I'm going to be on the ground doing combat stuff. I'm gone all the time. I'm more in danger. This is just something that I'm going to have to do. Yeah. No kidding. She looks me right in the eye and goes, but I get to go to Colorado, right? <laughs> and I just started <laughs> laughing so hard. I was like, well, I know where I stand. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, um, but 
you know, and we're religious and, and we believe, you know, God talks to us and she just felt like God said, you need to go to Colorado. And that really changed my career from, Hey, I'm going to be in aviation to being special forces. Cause I, I would have never said, I want to go do special operations stuff. Yeah. I'm very good being a, um, an aviator. I, I enjoy, I loved being in the B-52. It was a great community. I, it was just fun. Um, but it was something that I, I knew I was supposed to go do. So that, that was it. Um, and from then on, I was, uh, was going to be in the community, uh, you know, at 10 years, I looked like I was going to go out uh, and get out of the military. And it just felt like, hey, this is not what we're supposed to do. At that point, this is number two of the time that I was told I could do something. I jumped in and then they changed it on me. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, okay, what what do I want to do? And they said, hey, you can go and select for this thing called the 13th ASOS and you can go work with the Rangers and, and all this. And I was like, I'm in, let's go do that. That sounds like fun. Cause I was with the 10th group when I was out at Fort Carson okay. and that was a blast. And, um, you know, special forces is, is so much fun. There was a lot to do. So working with the Rangers, I was like, uh, huh, yep, I'll do that. Right. And so I say, yes, I signed the contract two weeks later. They were like, you know what we really need you to do? We need you to go down to Florida and be at the schoolhouse and help start up this 13 Lima, which is officers for TACP. Right. And I was like, that's not what I signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not an education. I'm not an educator. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Yeah. Uh, no. And they were like, we need it. And if you know me, if, if someone says, hey, we need this, then I'm like, okay, fine. I'll do whatever you tell me to do if that's sure. where I'm supposed to be. So I was like, yep, all right, I'm going to go do it. And it was the greatest thing that I've ever done. And so, so many times in my life, people have spoken truth to me and I, I'm not the smartest man. So I sort of listen to other people and are like, Same. what, what should I do? Yeah. And, uh, and so that was it. Uh, so they told me what to do and, um, I was like, okay, we're, we're going to trust you and, and do it. And so, um, nine times out of 10, people have the best interest uh, for you and they can see things that you can't necessarily see. Sure. Uh, and that's what I loved about the military is because people invested in people Yeah. And, and that was their primary goal. Now, there were some that were not, and obviously that's any case, but majority of the time they were. So yeah, I went to that and the opportunity came right back around. I go to the 13th later. Uh, and now when again, you say 13th, you mean 17th, uh, seven. Yes. Sorry. 17th. <laughs> okay, so 13th. Well, the 13th was... at Carson. So that's probably, yeah. probably where that, yeah. I was like, yeah. wait a minute. So I was at, yeah. I was at the 13th at Carson, uh, and then 17th. Yep. To right, go right. work, uh, with the Rangers there. And so, uh, that was just a, a blessing to go to the community that, that I wanted to go to originally and to be able to work that. Uh, and then. Again, I was supposed to go to uh, a place up in D.C., New York area, and uh, I was actually going to New York City uh, to work there. And then all of a sudden that canceled because uh, they couldn't find a director of operations for the 17th. And so I extended a year there to do it. Nice. I tried to go back to the organization that I was going to. And it didn't work out. Yeah. And so um, I, I felt like I lost an opportunity there. Uh, went to do the schoolhouse again, in, um, but this time in San Antonio. Again, biggest blessing I, I had. I had great leadership. I learned so much. It was an incredible venture that I would have never had the opportunity to do if, if I would have not extended. Uh, and then sure enough, right when I'm done, I go back to that same organization that, that I would have gone. So there's so many times in my life that uh, my timing is not the right timing. Right. And I've been saved so much. I mean, I can name three massive incidences that happened at an organization that I was not, that I was supposed to be at in my mind, mm -hmm. that I wasn't at, that if I would have, that would have changed my career and my vector for everything. For sure. And so, um, 
you say it's a diverse and and it, it is extremely and I think it's probably diverse because I stopped and listened to those who cared about me uh, and gave me knowledge and wisdom that I, I just didn't have. So, yeah. Yep. There's my, there's my career in a nutshell. <laughs> it all kind of works out kind of to your point. You know, we just kind of need to sit back and just listen and kind of accept what happens when you get out as well. Like it, it, if you, any time in your life where you feel like you shouldn't be there, you can change your mind and kind of figure out a way to make the best of it. The success is going to be there or for you to take kind of a point. So anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, you kind of glossed over this finance part, but I saw something in your bio that was like kind of really interesting. You had during when nine 11 kicked off, what, what's this thing about you had to go down and, and to some banks and do some things. What was that? What's that, yeah. what's that story about? So this was crazy. Um, and it's more of a life story than, than anything else. Um, so I'd met a girl, uh, in August and, um, I, I did not tell anybody I was in the military and we were talking and, uh, August of 2001 and we were supposed to go hang out, um, and that evening and that was of nine 11. And so all of this is happening. I call her at like 10 15. And I was like, Hey, um, and I left a voice message. I was like, Hey, this is Chris. I know we're supposed to meet up tonight. Uh, not going to be able to do it. Uh, I'll give you a call when I have some time. I'm doing that as I am on the phone here and trying to work out on the computer of how am I going to go pick up things? And so I'm simultaneously working this date calling this off who happens to be uh, my wife now. Okay. Um, and so uh, I have to call all these banks and say, how much money do you have? And of course, nobody wants to tell me how much money you have. Right. And I was like, listen, uh, my boss here at McDill is asking me to go pick up all the money and cash that I can. And I need to know how much you have and how much I can withdraw. And uh, so I, I do that and I head downtown um, to downtown Tampa and grab money from banks so that we can hand out cash to um, CENTCOM and SOCOM as they are spinning up and getting out to deploy. Wow. And it's the weirdest thing is you have uh, someone calls and says, Hey, I need $250,000. I need you to bring it to, uh, the airport and you walk out and these guys just show up and they're like, Hey, I heard you have some money <laughs> sign here. I hand them a couple hundred thousand dollars. They get on a plane and take off, not a military plane, but just yeah. a plane. And I'm like, all right, man, I hope <laughs> I'm not going to jail. Right. <laughs> I'm just, just a and I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I got to meet Tommy Franks um, and hand him money, which I am the biggest. You want to talk about a guy who did it right in the military. Yeah. It, it is General Franks. And he got in trouble that people were like, hey, he's taking his wife on planes and everything like this. And the only reason that I remember this is because it was so weird to me that a general was writing me a personal check. And I had personal checks from him for a dollar amount. And I was like, I went to my commander and was like, why, why do I have money from a general handing me this? And he goes, oh, he wants to take his wife with him so that they can spend time together and they can be a family together while he's always gone. And, you know, I can think of another four star general that did not do that and yeah. got in a lot of trouble, you know? And, but I remember being like, well, where does he get this? He calculated the fuel cost of her weight on the aircraft <laughs> and wrote the government a check so that they didn't cost them one dime of fuel or anything else. And I was like, this guy's, this guy's got, it. he's yeah. locked in. He's amazing. So a uh, huge, biggest fan of, of uh, General Franks out there. Yeah. Sorry, I, I met him one time. He he did like a troop visit when I was in Afghanistan or something. And 
so I don't really know him that well, but he was super cool and he was giving people hugs and he was like, he, I've never heard anything bad about him. And that, that kind of stuff is the only thing I have ever heard about him is that he's a super nice guy, very conscientious, very, just a great dude. Yeah. I've never heard anything bad about him. So that, yeah, that's a lob shot from somebody outside that doesn't know. Mm -hmm. and, and so once you know him and, and have seen it work, everybody's like, no, that didn't happen. Right. That's, right. That's false. So. Well, that's amazing that you were, I mean, cause you know, I'm probably, I, hell, you, I could have some, used some of that uh, op fund that you were handing out during the, I'm sure a lot of the guys have listened, that have been on this podcast or listened to it have, you know, used that money that you doled out to those guys. That's a, that's fascinating. Because I was thinking you said finance. I was like, oh, he's just sitting in, you know, the finance office on base and processing travel vouchers or whatever. But you were, you were like, you had a huge impact on the on the war just by doing that. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was it was really fun. And, it, you know, I was just a finance person doing travel vouchers. I was in charge of travel vouchers. <laughs> um, but finance does a lot. Like yeah. people don't realize what they're doing and, and how money gets charged and where it goes. And and so, um, you know, I've, I've always heard and uh, Colonel Traxler, he was the commander at the 17th. Right. He always stated man, there's there's no tip of the spear in the 17th. We're all doing it and supply, support, finance. All of us play a part in able to get the, the bombs on target. And man, he's right. And oh, I, sure. that was that was a blessing for me. Like if I wouldn't have known all that, I wouldn't have been able to help so much and, and I wouldn't have been able to, to do teamwork. So again, not what I wanted to do, but uh, <laughs> it was it was required for me to be there. Hey, before before we jump yeah, off, ahead. let me, you you touched on something and it got me to think about making sure you use people and the talents that they have. And one of the best stories I've had, and not a lot of people know this one, and so I'm not going to use this person's name, but everybody will probably know who it is. Okay. Um, we had a, I believe he was a staff sergeant at the time. He may have been a tech sergeant. And in my mind, I'm not going to say what he thought, but in my mind, uh, he just didn't appear to be doing well. Mm. And he just... And when I say doing well, he was fantastic at his job, um, but just his mindset wasn't right. Sure. You know, it just, he wasn't excited. So I called him in and I was like, man, what do you do? What's your thing? And he's like, well, I actually like tech stuff and, uh, you know, I, I can do this. And I was like, oh man, I have a project that is all tech. And so can you run that for me? He was not a top performer, but when I put him on a tech thing, and this is a, a, a tech P, he crushed it, yeah. excelled at it. He understood how to do his own um, ownership, and it, it led. Uh, currently, he is out of the military. He is extremely successful uh, in a podcast, and... Um, and he uh, he's done very well for himself yeah. uh, running a type of business and stuff like that. But it, it's exceptional to me to see if you just put people in the right place, if you actually stop to take a second and say, what do you enjoy? What do you like to do? Uh, then people will just crush it. And uh, man, there, there are a few people. Uh, I've got a football player um, that I coached. He's now a professional athlete. Uh, just knowing him as a person, uh, extremely successful. And this guy in, in the enlisted, just um, extremely successful. And I'm just so super proud of guys who find their niche in this world and, oh, and yeah. knock it out. So, yeah. All right. No, sorry. Random. No, that's a good point. I mean, uh, that's some things that leaders sometimes forget about is that specifically military leaders, they were in the military, you know, everybody needs to conform because we're going to war and I don't need you questioning me. So, you know, that whole one size fits all mentality is good if you're, you know, leading a squad of Rangers or whatever. But if when you get back in the rear and you're in the office, like kind of to your point, you almost have to do individualized leadership to each guy. Because, I mean, if you use the same technique on the guy you were talking about that you would on another guy who's a hard charger and you got to you got to rein him in instead of motivate him it's not going to work. You know, he's going to, he's not going to take to it. He's going to be, he's not going to be receptive. That's kind of a leadership style I've always used is finding out what, what this guy likes, what's he about? You know, who, what, what can I, what kind of technique can I use to motivate this guy to do 
what everybody else is doing. And again, I don't, I'm not not to the point where we're coddling him and at the, and you know at the end of the day he's got to do what he's got to do. But it's not always like that. And frankly, ninety percent of the military is not like that. I mean, like you probably experienced that a lot in the in the finance world before you got in the, the buff world. Those kids are coming in. They're finance guys. They're not combat oriented airmen or whatever. So you have to find a way to motivate those guys to do that work, which frankly, they, they might have just, they might not have wanted to do that work. They might have just kind of been told to do it. But that, to, the reason I'm saying all this is because it translates to the civilian world. Like a lot of guys get out of the military, they get a civilian job and they're like, just shut up and do it, man, because I told you to do it. The job has got to get done. You know, it's like, this is the end state and this is the mission. And, and, and that doesn't work for anybody in the civilian world, frankly, you know, unless Ever. you've got another hard charger, you know, but uh, have you experienced that at all? When, like you've been out a while. Have you you know, had that experience with the civilian world as far as like figuring out a way to, to lead people that have never, ever been in the military, never had any kind of military background or anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually, you know, you, you say that, and that was a lesson that I learned really, really early in my military career. Uh, you know, being a collegiate athlete, uh, that is, you know, you, you show up at six, you're getting your workouts done and just suck it up. You right. Know, you just go. Yeah. And so, um, when I went to finance, I had that mentality of, hey, shut up, just go and do it. <laughs> right. And uh, I just remember um, I, Colonel Burrell, uh, he was Captain Burrell at that time. He, he was like, listen, you can't just tell people what to do. You have to lead them. He's like, you're a phenomenal, phenomenal leader at one type of leadership. Right. But you have zero understanding of how to lead outside of that. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, Ooh, yeah, that's good. That's, that's really good. And when I got out and I'm trying to lead others, it was, it was really hard because translating what I was saying, and people say this all the time, when you have a resume and you move it from military speak to civilian speak, that's great, but you're stopping and you're focusing and you're doing this until you can learn to speak without using an acronym, without using a military slogan, or even something that you think everyone knows about, and they have no clue what you're no talking idea. about, because that is <laughs> just a military uh, phrase. Uh, until you can do that, man, you're, you're in trouble. Because yeah. uh, people will look at you and they will ask you the question. But about three months later, they're going to come back to you and be like, oh, I had no idea what that means. I had to Google it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, a good example of that, I used to use squared away all the time. I'm like, oh, that guy squared away. Or, man, get yourself yep. squared away. And this dude, good good buddy of mine, had no idea what that meant. And it didn't dawn on me that that's probably a, a military-founded you know, phrase that we only we use. I don't even know what the origin of it is, but... Uh, yeah, he had no idea. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And there, to your point, there's like tons of stuff like that. It just rattles off your tongue. You know, they're just, you know, giving that blank look. Hey, real quick, tell me about this. Um, and if it's still hard, we don't have to talk about it. But I'm always fascinated with, you know, because I was in the tech P world my whole career. And um, I, but I love to hear about guys who have branched out. And you obviously branched out first. You went to finance and then you went to the buff world. Tell me about do you feel comfortable talking about your first deployment? You know, you, um, cause I, it, we, when for us, it's like you go to the war zone and then you, you're there and then you come back, you know, you're never, you never, you don't yeah. go somewhere stage and then go in. Usually you're always kind of in it, but do you feel comfortable talking about that first deployment or how do you feel? Yeah. 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 We'll, okay. we'll talk about this. This is obviously something that, that I have to be able to do and, and it's very difficult for me. Um, so I was probably worst case scenario, and I get that. Um, I, when I went in, graduated. Um, well, okay, we'll back up. I show I show up in mid September uh, to the thirteenth ASOS there at Fort Carson, and I walk in and I was like, I want to work with the tenth Special Forces Group. You know, and I'm sure the boss is looking at me like, all right, new guy, why, why don't you just figure out what we do first and then you can tell me what you want. <laughs> um, and so it took me a while and I had some amazing people just sort of mentor me and, and teach me where to go. But I show up and then three months later, I'm downrange um, with Siege Soto, 10th Special Forces Group. Um, I don't know anything. Like, I don't know anything. 
And my experience uh, in combat was at 40,000 feet. And the most frustrating thing in the world is, is I'm, I'm up here and I'm listening to the radios and people are in gunfire and I just want to drop bombs and I just want to help. And there's nothing I can do, um, for collateral damage and other things like that. And like my best weapon was flying over them at 500 feet, you know, that, that was about it. And so that was very frustrating. Well, now I'm in watching probably eight missions a night, talking to the JTEX on the ground, controlling the aircraft, checking them in, checking them off, passing them down to the JTEX and, and working through this still again, hearing the gunfires and not being able to help. So it's a very frustrating thing yeah. um, for me. Now I have my team, uh, eight individuals um, who that's, that's my, those are my guys, right? This is my responsibility. And if something happens to them, I'm answering the mail back to the families. That's who I am. Well, then it becomes a larger group of, and I don't want to say the number, but let's say 80 to a hundred um, JTACs all over. And I've got CCT. Uh, I have PJs. I have um, SF JTACs. And then I have Air Force JTACs and JTACs that are coming in um, that were not part of the soft uh, unit at that time. Um, and so now I'm traveling around, talking to them, seeing what they can do. And we were working every night. And so I get up at 2.30 in the afternoon, I get a workout in. And when I say get up, I'm drenched in sweat because it's 140 degrees in the summer, <laughs> air conditions gonna blow. And so you wake up from just all the sweat all over you. <laughs> Go get a workout, um, get to work by 4.30, check in, get everything situated, grab some chow about six, uh, get back about 6.30. And then the pre-meeting start where you're allocating aircraft, uh, Mission start later that night, goes all night. You're done at 6.30, grab breakfast. Your post reports are done about 8.30. Uh, and then about 9 o'clock, if you can settle down and get some sleep, you try to get your five hours of sleep so you can get up the next day and do it again. Um, and so it's a six-month deployment. I was actually extended to a nine-month deployment. Um, and every day, there were no day off, days off. We were going. It was during the surge. Um, so we were peaked up. I was exhausted. I was mentally done physically. It was very taxing. And I just, I'm so thankful, so thankful um, that we were in such good physical shape that it would push us. Um, but it was the mental. I wasn't ready for what I was uh, seeing and doing and hearing. Uh, I wasn't prepped for it. There was no mental. Uh, acuity and no one knew what we were doing. Watching my guys suffer the way they did and suffer through it um, was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do because I wanted to take that on for them and I wanted to relieve the pain and knew I could not. And, uh, you know, you're encouraging and, and you're just pushing through. So for me, that was very difficult. Um, we were doing funerals probably twice a week um, for people that were in the siege of soda. And, you know, these are pe some people we didn't know, you know, they were out in the outstations, but a lot of people we did. Yeah. And so you're watching buddies drop um, left and right and you're frustrated. So for me, that became, it was never the combat. It was never doing the job. It was never, that was not the difficult part for me. It was the enduring what other people were enduring that was yeah. difficult. And that, you know, back when, when I talked about you, I'm, I'm an HC 130 guy. You know, I want to help people. That's my job. I was never the B-52. I want to inflict it. Um, it became the I can see that I'm helping people by doing that. Um, and that's where it came to. So very difficult time. Um, coming back was harder. Um, and that was, that was very difficult for me because realized that when I, I remember they gave us three days in some location where we were supposed to decompress before we go back home. 
and take care of ourselves. And I'm with my team and I'm in a tent with other people who have been deployed and they haven't done anything. And they're just talking about how awesome it was. And they got so much school done while they were over there and they got paid a lot and all this kind of stuff. And I literally went to the, uh, to the Sergeant major. And I said, my seven guys and I need out of there right now, or I swear to you, they're going to beat somebody down. Like, I will, I will do my best, but I'm telling you, it's not going to end well. And, uh, and he was like, oh yeah, we can do that. And they separated us. And so that was thankful. We get back home and one of my, uh, JTACs is going through a mental health assessment. And back in the day, it wasn't good. We didn't know this stuff. Right. And so he goes and this doctor's looking at this paper and reading it. And he has to answer what's on the paper. And the question was, did you see one of your teammates die? And it didn't say teammate, but that's why I said. And this JTAC was like, well, sort of. And the guy was like, well, it's not a sort of, it's a yes or no. (laughs) And and, uh, he's telling me this story. And like, you know, when you get mad and it's just starting to fuel up and it's coming from the inside and you're like, And he, and he goes, well, an Abrams tank hit a IED and it flipped the Abrams tank. And for 45 minutes, I stood outside waiting for a crane to come to turn it over. And these people burned to death inside. And I was listening to their screams for 45 minutes. And the doctor therapist looked at him and said, but you didn't see them. Right. And I'm like, come on. He did not say that. And he's like, yes. And this is, this is where my immaturity as a young captain happened. I left that JTAC and I went and drove my butt over from Fort Carson to the air force installation. And I just went and just let him have it. And I'm like, uh, probably not using the best words, <laughs> certainly not being positive. Um, and, and I did. And my commander ripped me a new one for it. Um, this is not what we need, you know, but I, I didn't know how to handle it. Sure. I didn't understand why a person would be so stupid uh, to ask those questions. And I didn't ever stop to think this person doesn't know what they're doing either. They're trying to figure it out. We're all trying to figure it out and I'm just attacking this person and doing it. And the next thing was, is my director of operations, who was brand new, he was an intelligence guy and, and, um, he came in and was doing his best and said something that I thought was crazy. And I went off and yelled at my director of operations. I'm a flight commander. I'm a captain. I'm a young guy. I yelled at my director of operation. I yelled at my commander and I'm just going off on them. And like, when I say, yell, I raise my voice and I don't ever raise my voice. That's not who I am. Um, and she looks at me in this look and just no judgment, no anything. She looks at me and she goes, is that all just as quiet as that? And like some (laughs) young guy yells at you, I'm, I'm in, I'm engaging. She didn't. And she was like, is that all? And it was so much of a pit in my face of you have completely lost composure. You've completely lost just thought. You don't know what to do. You're, you're out of control. And I just, I don't even think I looked her in the face. I just looked down so ashamed and was like, yes, ma'am. And she's like, that's all. And I got up and I walked out. Uh, And later that day, she calls me back into the office and, um, she's like, do you need help? And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she's like, go. And so she set me up with, um, uh, a way for me to go. And I was sidelined for almost six months. Um, and it was the best thing that anyone has ever done for me. Um, and they taught me how to deal with emotions. They taught all those things that I should have been taught before. Um, but I'm a 
go get them. I don't care. I probably wouldn't have listened anyway, right. um, type of guy. And, uh, and I did. And, um, it really helped me throughout my career. And I, I don't say this lightly. People say this all the time, but I mean it truthfully that saved my life. Absolutely saved my life. Um, and so I'm so appreciative um, of that moment. So those are the tough things that when you're, you're deploying and trying to figure out um, what happened and how, and, and uh, you just got to sit and listen. And luckily uh, I had the right person uh, and she can tell you her story if she wants to, I won't tell it, but um, the person who could hear me, who could know what I was going through and that was willing to humble herself to take care of the people she was in charge of. Man, that's that's not normal. I, I have not had a whole lot of those commanders uh, and I'm just blessed that, that I had that one at that time. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, she could identify that this isn't really you. She knows what you've done. You know, she knows you were just getting after. And also what people, I've heard, had a couple guys talk about that on here, that it's worse sitting back, listening to other guys go through it than it is to be in it. Like uh, it, it's mm -hmm. much easier. Like when I was, when I was in, you know, when I was deployed, you know, you're just there, that's it. You're doing it and you get used to it. But when, you know, when you're sitting back and you're monitoring all this combat operation that's going on and you have empathy on your, you're feeling the same thing these guys are feeling because you, you, you've experienced it, but you can't do anything about it. You're just, you know, it's mentally, it's exhausting. And so it's cool that she could identify that you were going, that you were having that hard time. And instead of going, Hey, I'm your boss and I'm outrank you. She's like, okay, this guy needs a little bit of assistance. That's awesome. You can give me her, her name offline or you can say it online. I don't know, um, but I'd, I'd definitely like to sit down and talk to her for sure if she's willing. Yeah, and and I, you know, obviously Tuco's talks, it's one of those ones that I, I'd love to have that conversation. Um, but it was uh, at that point, I, she may have been a colonel at that point, but it's uh, Deanna Violet. Oh, um, I've, heard my, I've heard a lot about her for sure. Yeah, she's <laughs> nothing but good stuff for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, just... Uh, a stud great great leader yeah. um so appreciative for uh for her and everything she's done so uh i i am still trying to get the courage up to uh to call because there's so many things that when when you're going through all of that at that time and you, there's just so much regret of things said and unsaid oh, yeah. uh and just to be able to to work through that um Man, but yes, absolutely have her on the, the podcast. That would be amazing. It's almost worse when they do that stuff to you. Like we talked about uh, mentors and, you know, leaders. Jazz used to do that kind of stuff to me, or not to me, but to everybody. You you would get all fired up and he would just, you know, just be calm and look at you like, y'all, is that it? You know, and then you're like, then you feel like a total jerk because <laughs> to me, the best type of leader is a guy that you don't want to upset you know not not because you're scared of them but because you don't want to let them down and yes. jazz is kind of guy like i've had a lot of leaders like that kenny Lindsay, jazz you know i just have a laundry list of guys that were like that and it's such a cool kind of leadership technique that you instill on in these guys that they they don't want to mess up because they don't want to let you down so i'd much rather have you know have them yell back at me and you know kind of say shut yes. up and i'm the boss and you get out and do push-ups or whatever but when they just look, give you that look like hmm I'm disappointed in you. You know, it's kind of like your dad, yeah. you know, oh, like when you were a kid, yes. like, oh, it's like cuts to the bone, but <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But it, but that's a, that's, it's a better lesson. I think it's, you know, you hit that hits home way better than a, uh, an ass chewing for sure. Um, did you want to, uh, talk about any kind of your, uh, B-52 deployments at all? Was yeah, it... that was, that was crazy. Um, I yeah, got the impression so it was a little different. It was way different and it, it was surreal um and so we we leave and we fly out and you're in diego garcia is okay. where we were yeah. which it is a volcano uh <laughs> that has a little ledge it's probably three miles long and it goes around in a circle uh with this cove in the middle of water um and you take off out of there and you fly eight hours to get into Afghanistan, you do your mission and then you fly eight hours back. How long would you loiter? How, how was your play time when you got to Afghanistan? Eight hours. Oh, so you flew for eight on station for eight and then eight back. 
Good lord! Yeah. You, and it was it was plus or amazing. minus. We're 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 twenty three some hours. Sure, up sure. In the air. Amazing. So here's the deal: you would have uh, fly. You'd be off the next twenty four hours, and then you would either prep and then fly again. Um, and so you we had these go pills and no go pills that we would take. Um, and it was the safety of flight, right? So you don't, your, your most important part of a flight is taking off and landing. And so you want to make sure you've been up for 24 hours. You want to make sure that you're taking these pills, mm -hmm. um, so go. And then, then you have, Hey, you're in a combat situation. You've been up there for 12 hours. You're now dropping a bomb. You want to make sure that you're good to go. Okay. So you would land. And then you would have to, uh, when you land, you had to take a go pill, right? To make sure everybody's awake. Then you would have to show up at work 12 hours later. Well, you just took a go pill. And so now you're awake. So now you have to take a no go pill to put yourself back down the counter. Then you're going to wake up. Then you're going to be at work. Um, for 12 hours, then you're going to go right back to sleep. Then you're going to wake up again and go fly. And so you've, you're groggy. And so now you've got to take a go. And then if you took some in theater, you've already taken those. So, uh, at that point I had taken 73 pills in my five month appointment. Uh, I felt like Elvis I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. And you know, I'm just trying to get all of this going so I can do my multiple flights. And it was brutal. And I got back and I was exhausted. I was smoked. Um, and so uh, hard time sleeping um, just because you're used to, it's like taking melatonin. Uh, if you stop taking melatonin, then you're, you're not able to sleep. So I'm, right. I'm all messed up uh, on that. But when we're in Diego, we're in paradise. I mean, it's beautiful. We're on the equator. Um, literally, we can go. I learned to um, ski with a board um, out there because they had this little area and they had a boat. They just take you out skiing. Uh, we de did deep sea fishing, uh, 100 pound tunas. Uh, more than 100, 100 to 200 pound tunas. And they were 60 feet off the coast because it was a volcano. So it went straight down. So it was deep sea fishing right there. Wow. So we would all go deep sea fishing. We'd catch a ton of fish. We'd come back. They'd cook it, cut it up for us. And we would uh, we would just be sitting there. And it would be like a vacation, except we'd take off and go do combat stuff the, the next couple of days. And so it was just a really weird yeah. deployment. Um, you're on, you're off and, and yeah, that, that one, I almost don't even consider that a, a true deployment. It was just different. Um, so yeah, I, I did, um, Oh seven. That was, uh, with siege of soda. Uh, Oh nine was, um, seals and rangers. 13 was rangers. 14 was rangers. Uh, and then some other deployments uh later which um my last last unit and last deployment it was great um i was able to work with other countries and we were working the the global war on terrorism and all kinds of different ways to get after that um yeah i ended up being um with a, a an organization that was the last one to work with um taking down isis uh, and so I learned a lot watching, watching them and, and seeing what they're doing. Uh, and, and so it was just a really interesting way to end my career, um, being able to see some of these organizations and some of these military organizations, um, work at the highest level and seeing how they treated people. Um, and it was different, right? Uh, so I, I think the military organizations that were working, they took care of people exceptionally well, mm -hmm. exceptionally well, um, physically, mentally, giving them everything they needed, fighting for them, working for them, getting them anything to be successful. Yeah. The other organizations um, 
who are not military, they did the people was not their number one. Oh, that yeah. that definitely was not it. It was the mission, and they will um, they will do whatever they need to do to whomever they need to do uh, <laughs> to make sure that that's taken care of. And uh, it was it was just completely contrary um, styles of leadership. Um, both absolutely had the right objective in mind and were both trying to get to the same point. They just had different ways of doing it. Sure. And so it was just great to see. I would love to go on a skip and talk to you about all that stuff. <laughs> I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. Uh, so you, that was your last assignment. So let's go from there. So we got, I know you got a hard out here in about 12 minutes. So let's, um, let's go to what you've been doing since you've been out and maybe some initiatives that you, you feel passionate about, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I went into a program and military has an incredible program called the skill bridge. And it allowed me to work with another organization as I'm getting out and transitioning out of the military. And so I was able to work with an organization in Denver, Colorado, um, which was attached to, or a part of Hillsdale college's, uh, Barney charter school initiative. And that taught me how to, take what I knew in education and, and leadership and transform it to a K through 12 type of curriculum. Nice. And so that was fascinating. I'm so my last deployment, I got back in January of 2020. Um, and, uh, I joined that organization in March of 2020 and exited September one or August 31st, whatever that is of 2020. I had about two months to get all of my transition done out of the military. Oh, by the way, February, COVID hit. Oh my God. Everything was shut down. Jeez. I didn't do a thing for, for getting out of the military. Um, I was so thankful for the organization for being able to sign everything. And they were like, person's not available to sign for everything. Yeah. And so, um, which really hurt me in the long run, but here nor there. So I was able to get to, to work in Denver, Colorado. I was able to do it virtually um, because there's no movement during that time in COVID. Um, my son ended up getting sick and um, the altitude was a major issue. And they thought that that was going to help where it could. Uh, so now I have to quit mid year. I have to find a job, um, outside and I have to move him somewhere out of altitude and I've got about a month to do it. So I find a job in North Carolina, um, fantastic school and was able to be the executive director out there. I moved my son, um, immediately to Auburn, back to Auburn, Alabama, and he's able to go to school there, uh, and, and work through that. Nice. My family moved uh, a little bit afterward. So I was working in North Carolina um, and just started noticing things are are not up to speed. Um, but I'm still in that military mindset. Like, I'm going to do whatever has to be done. Right. I'm going to move forward, put my head down and push through it. And I had a buddy speak some wisdom into my life. And he goes, why? Like, why? what if you don't do that today? What happens? And I was like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you're right. Like yeah. I, I remember my wife would be like, Hey, I need you to do this. And in my mind, I'm like, there, there are 31 people that are going in two helicopters to hit an objective that I need to be there to watch over. And I know getting the groceries is important for you. But right now, that's not the most important, right? I have to go take care of this, so I have to go in. Um, and now I'm in the same mentality, but there's not 31 people going to hit an objective, right? Yeah. It's just me saying that's what I do. And so I was like, I got to stop. And so I did, and, and I really um, stopped and, and came back and had to leave an amazing job um, and an amazing opportunity to be an executive director for a K through 12 
school of about 1500 people and, and just so much potential there. But I walked away and said, all right, came back here was a, um, intern head of school. I said, I'd do that for a year, uh, until they found someone, they ended up finding someone about eight months into it. Uh, and so I just stopped and was a teacher and I spent the last 10 months, um, trying to reset. And I should have done that right out of the military. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. I just, you've got to move on. You've got to protect your family. You've got to push ahead. You've got to do blank because that's what you've always done. And that's not the right answer. I'm sorry. That was not the right answer for me. Right. I needed time. I needed to process. Um, and so it made it harder on everyone because I didn't do the right thing. And so that was, that was a challenge. So, um, that's, that's where I was today. Uh, I am starting a school called Moray classical schools, and this is a private, uh, Christian classical school specifically designed for military kids. So I'm taking this education that consistently keeps coming back that I said, Oh, I, I don't do education. And so now I'm, I'm doing that. Um, but I'm targeting for military kids. So we PCS 11 times. Um, and during those times, my senior did, or, or I'm sorry, he's a sophomore now in college, but during his high school career, freshman year was in Texas. Sophomore year was in Alabama. Junior junior year was in Colorado and senior year was in Alabama. Four different states all trying to figure out what curriculum to use. We're trying to move around and it was just so hard. And there are a lot of people who are PCSing a ton of times and they need one particular curriculum to use. Yeah. Uh, and so there there was an opportunity for me to develop a school that could tailor for the military family as they were moving around. And, uh, and so that's what we're doing now. And nice. we're really excited about it. That's my, that's my passion and, and what I'm working for today. What a great idea that, cause I mean, that, that standardization is exactly what they need because I don't want to get on a soapbox, but that that's what bugs me the most about the education system in this country is that every single, it, it's not even the States. It's like every single district, it seems is pushing some different you know, agenda or, and I'm not talking about all this, you know, political stuff. I'm talking about like reading and writing and arithmetic and all that. Other it's like, well, we think this is important or it just seems like there should be a nationwide standard that way, no matter where you go or what you do, every kid is learning the same stuff. You know what I mean? And I, I think it should be at a higher level. I have always said, we, we don't push our kids enough. I think they're capable of learning way more than we give them credit for it. That, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's fascinating. That's, Make sure I want to get that information too. I want to post it. Are you, is it up and running or are you still in the, in the, are you still working on it or how's what phase are you in? I guess. Yeah. So we're, we're just starting off. It's going to start in the fall of 2024. Okay. Uh, and so it's going to, uh, we're going to do a, uh, virtual campus. It's, it's hybrid. Um, so virtual and in person. Uh, and so people can go to, uh, moray classical, uh, dot org and I'll, I'll get you all that. Um, where you can put it up. And then we have some YouTube videos that explains it in full detail. But awesome. I mean, here's, here's what I'll tell you. Just imagine this. Imagine a family here in Alabama um, has to PCS right now and they have to go to North Carolina. And you've got an entire family to pick up. You've got to worry about where am I going to live? What school system are they going to go to? Um, how am I going to find a house in that school system? The better school systems are going to be more expensive mm -hmm. and they're probably not going to be next to a military base. Right. So your transition is going to be long. If I could say, I'll give you a program where you don't have to worry about curriculum. You don't worry about the school. You don't have to worry about where you live and you don't have to worry about the cost of that. I'm taking all of that off of you. Just go find a place that you want to be that's close to base so that you can have a nice transition and have the house and life that you want. I'll take care of everything else. And then I'm going to put a school right next to the bases for you. And your, your same teacher that you had here in Alabama, Georgia, um, virtually, you're going to have in North Carolina, you're going to be at the same place, same courses, same curriculum all year long. And if you can't be there for a month, 
don't worry about it. I've got you covered. We'll catch you up as we go through. That's awesome. Like how much easier is life? Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's Jeez. perfect. Yes, the military kid, it's definitely great for them, but I I can see this thing transitioning over to everybody. I mean, it, what a what a great construct that it's like no matter where you go, because people move all the time, not just military people. So no matter yeah, where you go, absolutely. you can stay in the same school. And you say you say Alabama to North Carolina, but what about like Alabama to California or Alabama, you know, to Wisconsin or something? I mean, yeah. that's can you imagine? I mean, that's a very large cultural change. I mean, and you're keeping that that standardization, that kind of constant there. So yeah, that's uh, man, that's a great idea. Well, I know you got to go. You have any last bits of uh, knowledge? I mean, yeah, I, and. And here's what I say, and, and on Tuco's talks, we, we are always talking about leadership, but it always goes back to people. Uh, it always goes back to trying to listen to what people say, uh, understand where they're coming from, the empathy, uh, you use that word, and that's a great word, and, and then just trying to lead them. And if you lead your people, and if you care about your people, and you take care of your people, the people are going to take care of everything else. Yeah. You know, that, that organization, and I've been in some great organizations and, and one of them at the end, I especially loved, there's not one person in that organization who literally would not give their life for anyone else in that organization, right? Like that dedication, that passion. And it wasn't because of anything other than the person above them would absolutely do it for them. Right. Like they were, they were all in because they cared about the person and the leader of that organization, he was a Colonel and, uh, I loved it because there were times where he would put his headphones on and everyone knew, do not talk to him during that time. He's plugged in. Don't even think about it. Right. But when he took it off, he would talk to anybody. He, he would stop when he goes to the workout, he would have conversations and work out and talk to people and that personable, you can be a great leader who is off on his own and, and does his things, but be that person that that's engaging. Uh, man, it's incredible. So yeah, I, I just say, take care of your people. For sure. For sure. Well, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, this, this was fascinating and, uh, it was a unique career, and I love what you're doing with this with the school thing. And I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and, and sharing all this stuff. I appreciate it. Thanks, JD. I, it was an honor. Really yeah. was. Appreciate you.